My name is Jeff Brown, and I work on the Grails development team at Pivotal. Best job ever. Um, and uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, this morning is uh, GORM inside and out. And uh, the idea here is uh, to do a couple of things. One, uh, provide uh, an overview of, uh, of what GORM is and, and look at uh, a fair amount of detail. We're going to be able to get into quite a bit of, uh, of the GORM API and, and definitely give you a sense for what GORM is all about. And even those of you who have already done some GORM work, we may, uh, uh, some of what I'm going to cover is probably going to be review for you, but uh, we'll probably cover at least a, a few things that should be new to, uh, new to most of you. Um, so the inside and out part is uh, most of what we're going to focus on is GORM from the outside. And that's GORM, that's writing code that, uh, that takes advantage of GORM. So writing queries and expressing constraints and that kind of thing. Uh, using GORM, that's GORM from the outside. And then we're going to pick a particular feature of GORM and use that as an opportunity to drill in and uh, we're going to explore how that's implemented in GORM. Details that you don't necessarily have to know to take advantage of GORM but uh, details that are uh, really powerful to, to, if you understand how this stuff works, you'll, you'll find interesting ways to take advantage of that in other contexts as well. So we're going to spend most of our time working on uh, looking at GORM from the, uh, from the outside. Um, how many of you have, uh, have used GORM? Yeah, pretty, pretty much everybody, almost everyone. Good. All right, so GORM is, uh, is ORM, kind of reinvented. Um, GORM provides a convention over configuration approach to ORM. So initially, GORM was built on top of, uh, on top of Hibernate. And GORM still absolutely supports Hibernate. And uh, by default, that uh, Hibernate is the implementation that uh, uh, when you create a new Grails application, underneath GORM is Hibernate. But it doesn't have to be Hibernate. We'll talk more about that in just a bit. But by default, Hibernate is what's there, and Hibernate is the most common GORM implementation for, for folks, to, uh, folks to use. Initially, GORM was built on top of Hibernate. Right? Hibernate's a really powerful ORM tool. It solves, uh, it solves the ORM problems uh, really, really well. Um, but it has, uh, there are costs associated with Hibernate that uh, a dynamic language like Groovy can, uh, uh, can mitigate or, or eliminate. Uh, so, for example, if you're writing a, a Java application that uses Hibernate, you write, uh, typically you'll write entities, right? You'll write classes and define properties in those classes. And then you have to tell Hibernate about your persistent entities, right? So it's not the case that Hibernate just takes every class in the JVM and maps it to the database. That's crazy talk, right? You, there, you, you, wanna, uh, you only want to map certain classes to your database. So you have to tell Hibernate which classes you wanna, want to map to the database. One way to tell Hibernate uh, about that is uh, you can write uh, those uh, uh, HBM, the XML config files that describe which of your entities are mapped to the database. And they also can describe how the mapping works, right? So you've got a person class and you want it mapped to the people table, there's a way to express that. So you can write these config files and then give them to Hibernate and say, here's all the information you need to do my bidding. And then Hibernate goes off and does a lot of cool stuff. Uh, another way to do that is uh, you, you don't necessarily have to write those config files. You can do things like annotate your entities with at entity. And that's another way of expressing to Hibernate that this particular class should be mapped to the database. And there's a whole suite of annotations you can use to express uh, one-to-many relationships and, and cascading details. And so you can annotate, you can write to your Java entities and annotate them with uh, these annotations that describe uh, that a class should be mapped to the database and also describe some details about what that mapping looks like. But both of those approaches, writing the config files and uh, uh, annotating your, your entities, they're, they're doing the same sort of thing, right? You're describing, um, you're helping the ORM tool uh, do what you want it to do. You're telling it about which entity should be mapped to the, to the store and uh, describing how they should be mapped to the, to the data store. Uh, GORM takes a convention over configuration approach. Um, so you can, uh, the common thing in a Grails application is to skip all of that, right? To not have uh, the Hibernate config files and not have to annotate your entities uh, in any way. The, the, the normal thing is to just write your entities and inside of the source code for your entities, there's no mention of persistence, there's no mention of Hibernate, there, uh, there doesn't have to be any way. Uh, you just write a class like uh, public cl or, uh, class person. And in the person class, you've got string first name, string last name, and that's it. That's all the source code that's in that class. Uh, and somehow, Grails is able to 
do all the configuration stuff for you. And that somehow has to do with this idea of convention over configuration, right? So Hibernate needs, to, one of the problems is Hibernate needs to know about which entities to map to the database. So Grails uh, uh, leverages this idea of convention over configuration all over the place in the framework. This is just one, one example is what I'm about to talk about, but it shows up all over the place. So when you create a Grails application, at the top level of your Grails application is a folder called Grails-app, and below that folder is a directory called domain, and underneath the domain directory you can define classes, like the person class. Every class that you define under the domain directory is a domain class, and that means it will be mapped to the database using Hibernate. So the convention that you follow to express which entity, which classes are persistent entities is you define them under Grails app slash domain. And just doing that uh, replaces a whole bunch of the uh, configuration work that you'd otherwise have to do. You don't have to annotate the entities. The whole reason that you would annotate your entities is to express, hey, this is a domain class. But you don't have to do that with GORM. You define it in a certain directory, and that is how you express that that thing, that class represents a persistent entity. Uh, and then there are a bunch of sensible defaults that uh, the framework uses when mapping those entities to the, uh, to the database using Hibernate. So for example, if you have a, a domain class called person, the default is that class will be mapped to a table in the relational database called person. Right? The class name and the table name will, will be the same, and that's a reasonable default. If you want to change that, so if you, if you want your entity to, to be called person, but you want to store them in a table called people, there's a simple way to do that, right? So now you're wandering into configuration territory because you're deviating from the defaults, right? There are sensible defaults imposed. There are good reasons you might want to wander away from those defaults, and we provide a, a, a simple way to do that, and we'll, we'll see what that code looks like later. But uh, it's a one-line thing in your domain class. You say table, people, and that affects the ORM mapping. More, more details on that later. But there are sensible defaults and conventions you can follow that mean when you're using GORM, uh, almost all of the configuration burden goes away, which is great. Um, so all the information needed to, to do that mapping is present uh, at runtime, right? When we look at a class, we know the class name, of course. We can discover all the properties in the class. Uh, we know their types. Uh, a lot of the information that's, that's necessary to map your entities to the database is available. So we can do a lot of that mapping on your behalf. GORM can do a lot of that mapping on your behalf. Uh, so what I'm going to do is jump into, um, uh, we're just going to rifle through a number of different uh, specific features that GORM has to offer that affect how you define your, your uh, domain model and use that as, uh, um, uh, to help us explore a lot of the cool functionality that GORM has to offer. So for example, in a domain class, you can declare a property, and some of this is better expressed in real code. So in a domain class, you can express a property like uh, you saw on the slide there. Here we go. So this is a domain class in a Grails app, and that could be it. That could be all the source code. And a whole bunch of cool Hibernate stuff is happening to this class when I run the application. I don't, we don't see any of that represented in the source code, and, and that's good. Um, but one of the things I could do here is, uh, let's say that there is, so we've got a person class and an address class. And uh, let's say that instead of a person just having a home address, let's say that a person has many addresses. All right, so with that one line of code, a bunch of interesting stuff happens. So what I've expressed there is that a person has many addresses. So the value that I'm assigning to the has many property is a map. The keys in the map represent the names of collection properties that will be added to this class. So that, you would never type line eight but that is, uh, GORM adds that property to this class. So the property name is this. It's whatever the key in the map is. And the value that's associated with that key represents the type of objects that'll be stored in that collection. So again, you would never type line eight. That's added for you because of line seven. So you might say, well, line seven's even longer than line eight. Why don't I just skip line seven and do line eight? But a bunch of other stuff happens as a result of line seven. So as an example, a method like this, is added to this class. Right? Uh, so since we declared a, um, uh, the has many property and expressed that a person has many addresses, Grails knows that uh, 
Just that, that a person has a bunch of addresses, and you're probably going to want to be able to manage those, uh, that collection of addresses. So Grails adds a method like this. There's a little bit more going on in the method, but effectively that, that's what the method does. Add to addresses. It's really add to whatever this is. Right? So if I called this places, it'll still work. This property is called places. Uh, I just want to be clear that it doesn't have to be the plural of the domain class name. Right? So that's what happens. So a person has many addresses, and they're stored in a collection called places. By default, that collection will be a set, which is what's represented there on line 8. Like I said, you would never type line 8. But if you want, there are four types that that collection can be. They can be a set, a list, a sorted set, or a map. Set, list, sorted set, and map. Uh, by default, it's a set. And if you want it to be anything other than a set, the way to express that is to declare the, declare the property with the same name, it has to, you want to give it the same name, and give it a static type that is one of those four things, list, set, sorted set, or map, and everything else stays the same. This method is still added for you. Uh, just be clear, you, you would never write this method. That's added for you by, uh, Grails adds that method to your domain class. And also another method called remove from places uh, that does what you, what you think it does. Uh, and there are a couple of overloaded versions of those, but the point that I want to focus on is, is you've typed line seven, and the rest of the stuff happens automatically. All right? It's just going to get more and more involved as we move along. But any questions or comments about that? Yeah. Can, can I have two sets as many? Like, what if I want to have home addresses and then business addresses also a type address? Yeah, so the question is, can I do uh, that? Yeah. Okay, so you can't do that. Um, but you can do what you want to do, but you don't want to do this. The reason you can't do this, it really doesn't have anything to do with GORM. It has to do with just uh, with Groovy, right? You can't have two fields with the same name. That doesn't make sense. But you can do this. Right? It's a map that can have as many entries as you like. Right? So now a person has two collection of addresses, two collections of addresses. One of them is called places, and the other one is called home places. So you'd have a method called add to places and another method called add to home places. Do we need to be clear how GORM distinguishes addresses? Do they all go into the same address table? Uh, the addresses will be in the same table, but there'll be a join table. The, the foreign key, GORM will manage it for you is the short answer. But all the addresses are going to be stored in the same table. There'll be different columns in the person table that relate to, there'll be foreign keys that keep it all, keep it all sorted out. But as far as what we're looking at here, so far there's only one address table. So all addresses are stored in that same address table. Yeah? Address does have to be a domain class. Uh, so you're expressing that this persistent entity has uh, a relationship to some other persistent entity. Yeah, so it has to be a domain class. Yep. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, you're talking about, uh, do you have to, could you, could you move this up? Is that the question? Yeah. yeah, the order they're declared here is of no consequence. Yep. And you wouldn't declare it to be of type array list, you would declare it to be of type list. Yep. Yeah. That's correct. It, say that again. How does it work with type safety? Thread safety. Uh, so the question is, uh, so Grails generates these methods for you. How does that work with uh, thread safety? Grails is generating a method that does, as far as concurrency is concerned, that's what the method does. Uh, so there's, there's really no thread, uh, thread safety concerns going on inside of that method. The method does what you see there. So if you have, uh, there are other factors that are going to come into play there, right? So if, if you're using Hibernate and you've got two concurrent requests, that retrieve the same person from the database, and they're each modifying this uh, collection. Uh, by default, your, all of your persistent entities have this. They've got an ID and a version, and uh, so when Hibernate retrieves an entity from the database, it can interrogate the entity and know what version it is. And then when uh, um, there, there are two kind of separate approaches you can take to this. You can use optimistic locking or pessimistic locking. Um, but the version property that's associated with your person entities is a way that the uh, ORM tool can know when it goes to save an entity, 
if the version in the database is the same version that was retrieved, uh, and if they're not, then you get to decide how you want to handle that. Do you just want to stomp on the changes that the other thread made, or do you want to bail out and say, uh, do this again? But you've got to write, you know, your application's responsible for managing some of that. But the more just the thread safety part, the, the method does this. There's some other stuff in the, in the real method, but none of that relates to thread safety. There's another hand, yep. Go ahead. Why did you add the list of places on long uh, So if we, if we want the collection to be a set, we wouldn't do that. If you want the collection to be anything other than a set, it can be one of four things. It can be a set, a list, a sorted set, or a map. If you want it to be a set, that's what it is. And if you want it to be one of the other three things, then the way to express that is to declare the property and give it a static type. List places, map places, or sorted set places. You can, you can do this. There's just really no good reason to do that, unless you just want it to be explicit and just want to see it in the source code. Yeah. Uh, say that again? Uh, so if the type is a map, the keys are strings, and the values associated with the key is the address. Uh, so you don't get the change. The keys can't be anything other than strings. So it's, it's this. Right. Anything else before we move on? All right, so all we've done is declared that a person has many addresses, and we want to store them in a property called places. By default, places is going to be a set. Uh, we can have it be any of the other three things if we like. Uh, and GORM will add methods like add to places and remove from places to help you manage that collection. All right, and some of that's, so that's represented here at the bottom, right? So the, the static has many must be in the bookmark class. I've got a bookmark object, so I can refer to bookmark.comments. That will be the collection that stores all the, where all these comment objects are stored. Good. Uh, optionally, I can express at the other end of this relationship that a comment belongs to a bookmark. So here I've said that a bookmark has many comments. Right? The code in the top gray blocks there is in the bookmark class. A bookmark has many comments. Uh, optionally, I can express that the comment belongs to a bookmark. And what that means is when the, um, that this comment belongs to a particular bookmark. And one of the consequences of that is if I delete a bookmark, its comments are going to be deleted. Right? And sometimes that's what you want, and sometimes that's not what you want. Right? If you have a, um, what's a good, a good example? So you've got a music collection. So you've got an artist, and an artist has many albums. Right? An artist has many albums. Uh, so if you delete an artist, do you want all of those albums to be deleted? And if you do, one way to, to help uh, manage that is to express in the album class that an album belongs to an artist. Right? So if you delete the artist, the albums are deleted. Um, so for some relationships, that's what you want, and some it's not. Right? But this is, uh, so if you express that a comment belongs to a bookmark, uh, one of the consequences of that is when you delete the bookmark, all of its comments will be deleted. And another way to express that is, so here we're in the address class. If I can find it here, there we go. So remember that a person has many addresses, right? We expressed that back here. A person has many addresses. Um, and if I wanted it, the system to be such that addresses belong to persons, I can do this. I can do a couple of things. One thing I can do is this. Right? So a person still has many addresses. So I can create a person, give it a bunch of addresses, and persist all that to the database. Then later, if I retrieve that person from the database and delete it, all those addresses will be deleted. Another way to express this is like that. So instead of the value I assigned to belongs to being a class, which was what it was a moment ago, static belongs to equals person, instead of that, it's a map. The key in the map represents the name of a property that GORM will add. So you would never type line eight. Line eight is added to this class because of line seven. Um, and that's the difference between the two syntaxes. If the address needs a reference back to its owning parent, uh, person, uh, the syntax you see on line seven is how you would express that. And if the address does not need a reference back to its parent, then you would do something like line eight. 
the cascading works the same in both cases. You just do, do you want to be able to navigate from an address to a person? If the answer is yes, line seven uh, helps you with that. And if you don't need to do that, line eight helps with that. Yeah. How do you get the back reference without a lot of the cascading features? Uh, you can just declare the reference. You can just do this. All right, so there's no owning relationship there. Uh, you could call this whatever you want. Yeah? What if you started off without having this sort of um, relationship and if you added it later, what would go on to do? Yeah, the question is, what if you started out without these relationships expressed and then you add them later? And it's a good question. It's one of the challenges that, uh, that has to be dealt with when using ORM tools in general, not, not specifically GORM, just in general. Right, so the way this is written right now, well, let's, let's go back. This will be easier to talk about with the more simple model. Let's do this. I think that'll work. All right, there we go. So a person has an address, right, or there, there's, a, there's an address property in the person class. Try not to use the has uh, because that means something special. Um, so a person has, there's a property in the person class of type address called address. And there's an address class, and that's, that's it. So by default, how this is going to play out is there's going to be a person table, and there's going to be an address table, and there's going to be a foreign key that, uh, I forget which direction it goes in, but there'll be a foreign key going from, from one table to the other. And that's, that's all there is to it. Now, if I were to say something like this, right? Now, that's a whole different kind of relationship. And that can't be stored, can't really be represented in the same table structure that the other relationship was represented. I've got this one-to-many relationship now. I need a different uh, schema in my database to, to, to deal with that. Um, a couple of things come into play there. One is, or a few things come into play there. In your datasource.groovy file, uh, this is where your uh, GORM data source is configured by default. Uh, you've got uh, three separate environments. You've got a development environment, a test environment, and a production environment. So when you type Grails run app, you're running in development mode. And when you test, run Grails test app, you're running in test mode. And when you create a war and ship that off, you're running in production mode. And they each have their own separate database configuration settings. Uh, and uh, so DB create is uh, an attribute that's relevant to the question. And it can have uh, one of a number of values. It can be create drop, create update, validate or an empty string. What create drop means, and that's the default for your development environment, <clears throat> is every time the application is started up, the schema is deleted and recreated. The schema is deleted and recreated. Uh, it turns out we're using an in-memory database by default in your development environment, so the, the deleting it doesn't really matter. Um, so even if we weren't using create drop here, turn that off. Uh, we're effectively going to get create drop because it's an in-memory database. So you start the application up, the database is created, schema is created in the database, you can populate it and manipulate it and do whatever you want. When you stop the app, because it's an in-memory database, it's gone. It's gone forever, there's no, it's, it's gone. Uh, you can change this. Maybe you don't want to use an in-memory database, you want to use a file system database and, and H2 supports that. So let's say we pointed that URL at Oracle. We've got a, an Oracle instance at the shop. And instead of using H2, I want to use Oracle. So I replace this JDBC URL with uh, uh, the appropriate Oracle URL. And then I come up here and I change this to be Oracle's JDBC driver. So now my application is talking not to an in-memory H2. It's talking to a, a real Oracle. If DB create is set to create drop there, when you start the application up, all the schema is going to be deleted and recreated. And maybe that's what you want. Maybe that's not what you want. Uh, certainly, that's not what you want for your production environment, right? You can't delete your uh, database every time you start the app up. So notice the default configuration for your production environment is update. Uh, what update does, so what create drop does is it deletes it and starts over. What update will do is it won't drop anything. It won't delete any columns or tables or anything. Uh, but if the ORM mapping calls for columns, uh, as an example, calls for columns that are not currently in the schema, they'll be updated. The application will start up and the ORM tool will recognize hey, a new property was added to the person class like this. And there is no age property, age, age column in the person table, so let's create it. Uh, so that's what update means. Nothing gets deleted, uh, but the schema might be updated. Uh, 
Uh, in a lot of shops, the DBAs don't like this, right? They don't want your application muddling with uh, a schema at runtime, and, that, and that's reasonable for, for lots of places. So you can turn that off if that's not the behavior that you want, but that's what, what's there by default. For some kinds of changes that you might make to your model, uh, the ORM tool can modify the schema at runtime to deal with that, and for some, it cannot, right? If you make fundamental changes to the way things are, are, are relating in, in your domain model, the ORM tool is just going to say, I don't know, I don't know how to, it's, this is too different. I, I can't, uh, I don't know how to sort, sort all this out. The way this plays out in, uh, in practice is most applications um, will use create drop in their development environment, and they'll use the in-memory database. Right, so it's a non-issue, right? You just drop the schema and recreate the schema every time you start up the app. Um, maybe the, the next most common thing is instead of using an in-memory database, you have a development database that the whole team shares, maybe. So you point this URL at your Postgres or Oracle or whatever and uh, configure the appropriate JDBC driver. Now everyone on the development team is sharing a schema. Uh, and you have to manage that, right? So do you want to, one thing you could do is you probably don't want create drop in that mode, right? Because you got two developers running, I start the app up and I just deleted your database. That, that's probably no good. You, in a situation like that, you would probably configure, uh, you do one of two things. You'd configure your DB create either to update or to do nothing. If you configure it to update, you'll potentially run into problems if you've got people doing concurrent development and their schemas are not, you know, you're trying to share a database and uh, one guy's uh, model is different than another person's model, so the you're going to have problems. You're going to have to manage that. That's an argument in favor of just using your own database, which is why that's what the default is. Um, but uh, another uh, option, a common thing, is to turn off schema generation altogether. Turn it off. Uh, so when you start up your Grails application, the Grails application, GORM in particular, is going to expect uh, the schema to be there, and it's going to expect the schema to, to look like a certain thing. It's going to expect a person table and a first name column and a last name column. Right, the, the GORM is, is, uh, expects that to be there. If you turn off DB, uh, all the schema generation, then it's up to you to manage that, to make sure that the schema gets generated. A way to do that, uh, something that'll help with that, is, let's see if I can do that from here. There's a command called schema export. So I've just typed uh, Grails schema export, effectively. And uh, so that's running. And what that's going to do is it's going to load up my domain model. It's going to inspect my domain model, and it's going to generate a file that contains DDL that I could use to, let's just ins inspect the file. Is this it? Yeah, so this is the DDL that was just generated. When I, I just ran Grail schema export, and it generated this file. What is this file doing? It's, uh, it's uh, dropping constraints. It's deleting tables if they exist. It's creating the new address table that has, uh, has these columns. It's creating a person table that has those columns. This is what would have been sent to the database if I was using create drop. So what, what a lot of folks will do is they'll use the in-memory database and use create drop in their development environment and just go about their business and really not think too much about the schema. Just do your thing. Then you get your model to a point where, hey, this, this is probably what our real app's going to look like. You can run schema export, generate this, take this to the DBAs, say, OK, this is what my application wants the schema to look like, wants it to look like that. One thing the DBAs can do with that is they can just execute this now. right? They've got their tools to do that. They can execute this. And now the schema is exactly what GORM expects. Another thing that might come out of that conversation is the DBAs say, nope, you can't have a column called first name. Uh, we always, all of our columns like that are always called the first name, right? So you want this to be the first name instead of first name. So you can respond to that by renaming this, right? You do that, and now you're happy, but you don't want to do that, right? You don't want to compromise, you don't want to change your object model. Uh, your object model and your persistence model are two different things, right? So define your object model the way that it that makes sense. And then if for whatever reason, you need to do something like uh, store the first name uh, property in a column called the first name. Uh, you can do that, right? You can deviate from the default convention. So by default, the first name property will be stored in the first name column, um, but you can, you can change that. So to sort of circle back around and try to put a button on that. So you can define your object model and completely ignore schema, ignore the persistence model, just define your object model the way that makes sense. Uh, then at some point, you've got to be concerned about the schema because you need to make sure this, the schema is going to be there. You could run schema export to get this DDL uh, and then go 
have the meeting where you sit down with the DBAs and figure out whether this is uh, uh, going to meet their standards or not. If they're happy with this, you're done. And if they're not, uh, then uh, you, you've got to deal with that, right? Figure out what, what is it that has to change and then uh, uh, do things like I just described here. Change column names and table names and index names and stuff like that. Come a long way around, but uh, yeah, so you do have to manage. Um, as, as your object model is evolving, your persistence model has to evolve to be compatible with it. Uh, so you have to manage that. All right. Uh, yeah, so the, when you declare a has many, by default, the collection you get is going to be a set. And if you want the collection to be anything other than a set, your other options are list, map, and sorted set. And the way to, make, uh, to, the way to express that you want any of those is to declare the property yourself and give it a static type that is list, map, or sorted set. Yeah? No, it's from uh, it's core Grails. So if uh, uh, every Grails installation has the schema dash export command, that's been there for qu quite a long time. I don't remember when we added that, but it's been there since 1.x, I think. Yeah, in the red shirt. Yeah, the question is, do you have an import? So if you're starting with an existing database, is there a way to get from uh, from here to there? So you've got a schema, and you want to generate. Um, an object model of classes uh, that is consistent with that schema. There's nothing in Grails that does that, but there are uh, at least a couple of plugins that do that. And I'm drawing a blank. Ken, do you remember the names of any of those? Yeah, DB reverse engineer, DB reverse, engin reverse engine. There are plugins that'll do that, but there's nothing. That's uh, there's nothing in the core of Grails that does that. Yeah. Yeah. There is one of the plugins is the uh, the database migration plugin and it can uh, it can do some tricky stuff. Uh, the short answer is yes, but uh, I don't have the details in my head. Uh, but there's a way to generate diffs between schemas and then you version those diffs and then at runtime your application can look at your schema definition files and recognize that. The schema definition at runtime is version three. The version in the database is version two. And here's some SQL that you had to write that describes how to get from two to three. So at runtime, your app can figure out the deltas, uh, can figure out which deltas it has to apply to get the schema up to date. Again, that's, that's plug-in stuff. Uh, I think the database migration plugin does, does some of that. All right, let's press on. Uh, so convention over configuration, there are lots of defaults. Uh, uh, Grails imposes sensible defaults when mapping your domain classes to the relational database. And uh, those sensible defaults are perfect for lots and lots of scenarios. And when you want to wander away from those defaults, uh, you get to do that. I'm not going to drill too deep into this. Just uh, uh, very briefly, we'll explore, uh, get back to this mapping block that I defined just a moment ago. So for example, if I wanted uh, person objects to be stored in a table called people, I can express that. If I want the first name um, property to be stored in a column called uh, FN, I can do that. I can express things like uh, easy or eager fetching and lazy fetching for relationships. I can express things like uh, indexes that I want created, um, optimistic locking. The same kinds of things that you can configure with uh, Hibernate config files, um, you can configure in this mapping block, but you're expressing it in Groovy code instead of some external XML file or, or whatever. Uh, and, and something to note about that, and this is important, is uh, keep in mind that your object model and your persistence model are two different things, right? So don't, uh, don't conflate those and let one compromise the other. Um, your object model and your persistence model are two different things. So in my object model, I think of these things as persons, right? So I've got a class called person. A person has a first name, a last name, and a, a home address. But I think of them, it's a person. In my persistence model, I don't want a person table. I want a people table, right? When you're using an, an ORM tool, when you express a query, you always express the query in terms of your object model, not your persistence model. So if it turns out that uh, person objects are stored in the people table, the word people never shows up any place other than right here. Uh, so when I express a query, I don't say, give me all the things that are in the people table. I say, give me all the persons. So for example, if I, someplace else in my application, if I did that, person.list, what that's going to return is a list of all the person objects that are in the database. It turns out that 
the person objects are stored in a table called people because of this, but that doesn't show up when I express a query, right? I'm expressing my query in terms of my object model. The SQL that's gonna be sent to the database as a result of line eight there is something like select star from people, uh, maybe not select star, select uh, first underscore name, comma, FN, comma, uh, so that, that's enough, first underscore name, comma, FN, from the people table. So the SQL has FN in it because the column name is FN, but that never shows up in my query. So for example, if we used a dynamic finder, I would say find all by first name, Jeff. That's going to return all the person objects in the database whose first name is Jeff. It turns out that the first name property is stored in a column called FN, but that's not represented here. Right? Again, I'm expressing my query in terms of my object model, not my persistence model. Right? And that's good. You keep those things separate. Comments about that idea? Yeah. It will, so let's, uh, let's just look at that. So before I run it, note that uh, we've got a person table and a first name column, right? So let's, uh, let's, let's rerun it and uh, we'll see the effect of that. If it didn't do that, that would be, uh, that'd be lame. And the lame factor in Grails is very, very low, exceedingly low. All right, so now we've got a, uh-oh. Uh uh, did it run? It, it really does do it. I don't, let, me, let me see if it uh, actually ran here. All right, stand by. Uh, let's delete that, uh, where are we here? Person, people. There's no doubt that it does do what I say it does. What's going on here? You could. Uh, I don't see what's, uh, but schema export definitely respects this. Uh, I've got something goofy in the, in the project here. But yeah, so if you express uh, a table name in your mapping block, you know what it is. Do, 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 do. You have to clean all. No, you don't have to clean all. So I, I don't want to stay derailed there, but schema export does respect uh, your configuration there. I'm certain of it. Other comments about that? All right, let's press on. I want to focus mostly on, uh, on queries. Uh, so we'll talk uh, another couple of topics and then we'll get into uh, GORM queries. So here we're exercising um, the has many stuff that I talked about earlier. So a bookmark has many comments. So when, uh, so I've created a bookmark and I've called add to comments over and over again. And notice I'm not passing comment objects as an argument to add to comments. I'm passing a map as an argument to add to comments each time. And I mentioned briefly when I typed that example add to addresses method earlier that there are overloaded versions of that. So in the bookmark case, there would be an add to comments method that accepts a comment. And there's another add to comments method that accepts a map. And what the code in the latter is doing is creating a new comments object and passing that map to the constructor effectively. So you don't have to create the comments object in order to pass it to the add to comments method. Um, you can just pass a map that includes all the information necessary to create that comment. And that's what's going on here. Also notice that those add to comments methods uh, can all be chained together because they return this, right? So that means they're returning the bookmark. So I create, I call new bookmark and then I call add to comments that returns the bookmark, so I can call add to comments again. So I can say dot add to comments, dot add to comments, dot add to comments, populate the thing and build it up to have uh, all the data that it needs and then save it. And uh, when you call save, the thing will be persisted to the database. So there's no save method in the bookmark class, or at least there's no save method in the bookmark source code. Uh, but all of your persistent entities, all of your GORM entities have a save method. Um, and it, uh, it saves that, that, that instance to the database. So you would never write the save method. It's added to all of your domain classes by default. One thing that almost, that, that is not very common at all in GORM applications are DAOs. There are reasons you might want to have DAOs, but uh, for the, the, normally you wouldn't have DAOs. The sorts of things that normally exist inside of a DAO 
uh, all of that behavior is added to your domain classes uh, by the compiler. And save is a simple example of that, right? So you don't need a, a thing that has a save method where you pass bookmarks into it and it's responsible for saving the bookmarks. Bookmarks know how to save themselves. Yeah? What happened to ID is the question? Uh, so so what, what did happen to ID? What, what, are you get, what do you have in mind? Well, there is an ID column in the database. That's right, there is an ID column in the database, right? That's right. Yeah, the question is, can you just forget about the ID? Do you have to, what do you have to do about IDs? And uh, uh, when creating and saving instances, in instances, the answer is nothing, right? You, don't, you generally don't have to think about the IDs. One of the things you can configure in this mapping block uh, that I deleted is you can express um, that you want the ID to be assigned, right? And if, if you want it to be assigned, that means you're responsible for assigning a value to the ID before you persist it to the database, and then you have to manage the challenges of concurrent requests and all that stuff. By default, what happens is you just ignore the ID when you're creating instances. Create an instance and save it, and Hibernate has uh, different strategies for managing IDs. There's a thing called uh, the native strategy, which means delegate to whatever the database wants to do. Um, there's, uh, you can uh, use a sequence strategy, you can use, uh, there are different strategies you can configure, and one of them is assigned. Assigned means you have to assign a value to the ID, but normally you, you don't want to do that. You want to leave the, the native thing in place. So create a bookmark, save it, and it'll have an ID. You don't need to know what it is at that point. Later, when you want to retrieve that instance from the database, that's when you need the ID. So let's say that you want to provide the capability to um, um, uh, maintain a list of person objects. So you've got a person class with a first name and a last name, and that's it. Uh, there's an ID there, but you don't have to define it. So you create a person, you create a bunch of people and save them to the database. So they've all got different IDs, one, two, three, four, five. You don't, you don't care about it when you're saving them. Uh, so you provide a list of persons in, in the, the web UI, and in order to do that, you had to retrieve all those persons from the database, and they all have IDs. So when you generate this list, you can use those IDs when you create, uh, say, the link that you want to click on to view a particular person. So in response to clicking a link that says, show me Jeff Brown, uh, a query needs to be sent to the database that says, give me the person whose ID is 42. Right? So you would use the ID when you're building or executing queries, but generally when you're persisting entities, the ID is not something you, you need to be concerned about, unless you're using the assigned generator, which is unusual. There are reasons you might want to do it, but uh, you need a reason to do it. By default, you wouldn't monkey with the IDs. Yeah? Uh, you can, uh, so Hibernate has a lot of uh, flexibility around that, and uh, I don't keep all of that in my head. Uh, but uh, you, you can, uh, it does support uh, UITs. Yeah. yeah. The, yeah, the scaffolding makes some assumptions about, uh, about your IDs. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you start using assigned IDs or composite IDs, which are supported, you can have composite IDs. So your ID can be your first name plus your last name. That's a terrible idea, but you could do that. Uh, and the, so the scaffolding's not gonna work. That's not why it's a terrible idea, but the scaffolding won't work, right? The scaffolding assumes you've got a, a simple primitive ID. Yeah. Yeah, the question is if you're using the bookmark, if you're using a domain class as a command object in a controller uh, and you try to, to save, create a new one or update an existing one, uh, is it validated? And if it is validated, when is it validated? Is that right? Okay. So if you have a controller that, uh, I don't have a controller in this app, but we'll just, uh, we'll just say we're in a controller here. Right. Uh, when I define an action that has a, uh, uh, uses a domain class as a, a command object. When I send a request to this method, so before I send a request to this method, when I compile this class, what Grails is going to do, and I'm going to short, I'm going to pseudo code a little bit about this, but there'll be enough here to represent the answer to the question. So what will happen is uh, something like that. Subject P to dependency injection. Question is about the comments. Uh, and then the comments will get validated. Add to comments. 
So you're not talking about command objects. OK? My mistake? When you do add to comment, then comment needs to be validated before getting persistent. No. Uh, so in this case right here, so when you create a bookmark and add a bunch of comments to it and save it, uh, that save is going to validate the bookmark. And validating the bookmark means validating uh, everything that the bookmark has references to. So those comments. Uh, there is actually an outstanding bug that has to do with cascading validation. I'm drawing a blank on the details. But what should happen here is all the comments should be validated and not saved to the database unless they are valid. And some, there's, a, there's a bug around that that I don't remember the details. But that, that's, that's what's supposed to happen. So if there's an invalid comment, you don't get any of these things saved, correct? Your bookmark save fails? You don't get anything persisted. They're created, right? They're created before you even call save. So they exist, they're on the heap, and you can interrogate them and inspect their errors. Um, but yeah, if validation fails, uh, the thing is not saved. So when you call save on an instance, what happens is the instance is validated first. And if validation passes, then it's saved. And if validation fails, we bail out. We don't save the thing to the database. So one thing you don't have to do is create an instance, call validate, and then call save if validate passed. Uh, the more common thing to do is create the instance and call save. And if validation passes, the save will happen. And what's returned from the save method is the instance. right? It's like returning this. And if validation fails during the save, save will return null. It doesn't throw an exception. That's the default behavior. There's a way to make it throw an exception, but you don't want that. Um, generally, you don't want that. So save returns null if validation failed. Save returns the instance if validation succeeded. And any time you call save, validate is going to happen. Uh, by default, that's what happens. You can call save and pass as an argument validate false, and that'll skip validation. But that's not normally what happens. Yeah? So we got rid of the DAO, and we got rid of separate validators. And you're looking for an amen from the? All right. Uh, I celebrate that as well, yes. Uh, so he's wondering why no one cheered. But there you go. Uh, yeah, so we've gotten rid of the DAOs for the most part. I've uh, gotten rid of separate validators. We haven't talked about validation yet, but there's all kinds of cool stuff. We haven't talked about the details of validation yet, but there's lots of cool validation stuff. And that, that's a big part of the value that, that Gorm has to offer, is getting rid of a lot of that tedious stuff. Right? You end up with a, a lot less code. Uh, Gorm is one thing that's contributing to this, but in a Grails application, you end up with a lot less code than you, you typically would in another Java web app framework. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about, uh, about constraints. So when you define a domain class, you can declare a static property called constraints and uh, assign it a closure like you see here. In the syntax, what, what you can do inside of that constraints closure is, uh, this is an example of what you can do inside the constraints closure. And what you're doing is you're expressing some rules about what are valid values for properties in the bookmark class. So, uh, your properties are not nullable by default, so nullable false is, uh, uh, that's the default behavior. But if you had a property that it was okay for it to be null at persistence time, you could express that with something like URL nullable colon true. Um, so th th we've expressed here that the URL cannot be nullable, the title cannot be blank, and has to have at least one character and no more than 255 characters. And that affects schema generation, by the way. So if GORM is generating schema, it's going to generate, um, uh, depending on your database, it's probably going to be a varchar. And it's going to be wide enough to hold 255 characters. If that said size colon 1 dot dot 50, GORM will create a column that's only a table that's only 50 columns wide, right? Because it knows that the value can never be more than 50 characters. Uh, so some constraints affect schema generation, some don't. Uh, so the date created uh, cannot be nullable is what's expressed there. And uh, there's a lot of other stuff you can express in your constraints. You can say things like if you've got a number property, like an age, you can say that the age has to be greater than zero. Right? We have no people who, that have a negative age. That, that, that doesn't make sense in our model. And you've got a bank account class. You can express that uh, the account balance can't be less than zero. Or maybe, when you, maybe it's okay for the account balance to be less than zero, but you've got an initial balance that can't be less than zero. Right? You can't open an account with negative dollars. So you can express rules about what are valid values for properties in this domain class. And you're expressing them declaratively in one place. And that one place is right here. So if we've got 
20 places in our application where we create instances of the bookmark class and save them. One thing I don't have is code in all of those 20 places that checks the title property to make sure it's not more than 255 characters, right? It doesn't say if title that size is greater than 255. I don't have that all over the place, that imperative code. I've declaratively expressed a rule that says the size of the title property is not allowed to be more than 255 characters. And a consequence of having declaratively expressed that is every place in my application where I create and try to persist bookmark objects, if I, if I have a bookmark and I call save, these constraints will be imposed, right? So I don't have this imperative logic spread around my application. And as the rules change or the rules evolve, I've got one place to manage those rules. Uh, I express the rules for what is a valid what is a valid value for the title property in one place, and that's imposed across the entire application, which is great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the question is, is there a way to override the constraints? Uh, so you've got special rules that apply in some circumstance. So you can't really override them, but you can express constraints that are flexible in that way. So for example, let's give this guy, um, let's give him an age. So we're gonna define some constraints. We'll say the age has to be from zero to 95. We don't, we don't support people older than 95 for some reason. Um, and uh, home address, uh, normally we would say that it can't be null, right? Everyone has to have a home address, but uh, we'll say if someone, let, let's come up with some kind of arbitrary rule. So if the age is less than 10, it's okay for them to be homeless. It's the most twisted thing ever, but that's what we'll say. If the age is less than 10, it's okay for the home address to be, uh, to be null, right? Uh, so I, I can't, put like arbitrary logic here that says if, age, I can't do that, but what I can do is something like this. I can say, I can define a custom validator, and I'll describe what this is doing here. So validator is one of the validators you can use, and the value you assign to that is a closure, as uh, contrasted with this, where the value that I'm associated with range is a range, the value that I assign with uh, nullable is a Boolean, uh, and uh, there are others, right? But the value I'm associating with the validator validator is a closure. The closure can accept uh, one, two, or three arguments. We're gonna use the two argument version here. Uh, the first argument will be the value that's being validated. So it's gonna be the value of the home address property. And uh, the second argument will be the person instance. It's the object that, that's being validated. And note that we're in a static context here, so we can't really refer to this we're not inside a particular person instance, we're in a static context. So this is gonna be a reference to the person that was, uh, that's being validated. And I can do something like um, if uh, obj dot uh, age is uh, less than whatever our cutoff is, um, return true, else, return obj dot uh, home address, so, something like that, right? So what that says, if the closure returns true, that means validation passed, and if the closure returns false, it means validation failed. So now I've got some arbitrary logic I can impose here that says if the age is less than 10, I don't care about the home address, it's valid, right? So just return true. Uh, I should have thought about that for another couple minutes and came up with a more realistic example. But you can impose arbitrary logic where you get to decide if a particular value is valid under certain circumstances. Yeah. Does that, does that make sense? Yes. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, the question is, can you access the constraints on the web tier? And uh, to some extent, the, that already happens in the default scaffolding. So for example, it, the way this is written right now, if I generated the uh, default scaffolding for this, uh, for the person class, the form that's used to create uh, person objects, the place where you're entering an age is gonna be a drop down list of numbers from zero to 95, right? Um, and there are other examples of that that the default scaffolding does. But the more general question about do you actually have access to these in the web tier is no, right? So when you generate the form, uh, 
you're on the you're on the server side, you can interrogate this and, and maybe do some interesting things when you generate the form. But once you get once you're back at the browser, you don't have access to any of this stuff. All right. So yeah. Some, some constraints uh, affect schema generation and some don't. And let me show you. So the, the Grails user guide is what I'm looking at here, grails.org slash doc slash latest. And I'm going to, my resolution is funky. There we go. All right. Uh, so here is uh, the constraints documentation. This is a list of all the constraints you can use. And if we were to look at size as an example, there's a note here that says this constraint influences schema generation. So uh, it affects the, the width of a column as an example. Uh, most do not. So like the matches um, constraint. So you can express that a login has to match some regular expression. So the login has to only be character, uh, letters is what that says, right? Can't have numbers or exclamation points. The login has to just be letters. That particular constraint does not affect schema generation. Um, so, so some constraints affect schema generation, some do not, and the ones that do are documented as such with a note that looks just like that. I'm sorry? You a unique constraints? Yeah, so th there is a unique, um, a unique constraint that you can express that says, so, so if you were defining a user class and login was one of, or username was a property in the, in the user class, you can express that the username has to be unique, right, unique colon true, and this particular constraint does in fact affect schema generation. So that'll be imposed at the database level. That also means, this particular one also means that um, in order for validation to be carried out, a query has to be sent to the database, right? So there's a cost associated with that. So if you've got a, a person object and you validate it, uh, in order to validate it, we've got to go to the database to see if there's already, if that username already exists. And that, that too is documented here, but that's a consequence of, of the, the way the unique uh, uh, constraint works is there's no way to validate an object without making a call to the database. You've got to go look and see if uh, a violation exists there as opposed to a constraint like this, right? That we don't have to talk to the database to carry out that constraint. All right, let's press on here. I wanna to get to, uh, I wanna talk about queries. Queries is where a lot, of, a lot of cool GORM stuff happens. So you've got lots of options for expressing queries uh, with GORM. When you're expressing queries with GORM, uh, you're, almost, you're always expressing queries in terms of your object model, not your persistence model. Uh, so I'm going to just uh, describe a, a few ways that you can express queries, then we're going to go in, into some code and, and explore some, some cool stuff. So all of your domain classes has, have a method on them called, a static method on them called list. And what list does is returns all the instances of that domain class. So if we were using the Hibernate plugin, when we call bookmark.list, Hibernate is going to generate some SQL to send to the relational database that selects from the bookmark table. That exact same line of code uh, will work if instead of using Hibernate, if we were using MongoDB. All this code stays exactly the same. I don't know if Mongo supports like or not. I think it does. But in general, this code would stay exactly the same if we switched to another GORM implementation. So bookmark.list would still work, but bookmark.list is not going to send SQL off to a relational database because there is no relational database, right? The Mongo implementation of GORM knows how to go find all the bookmark objects and return them. And that's what will happen when you call bookmark.list. Uh, Grails supports uh, dynamic finders. Uh, an example of a dynamic finder is uh, the second line of code you see here. Bookmark.findall by title like. Find all by title like. So the string that's being passed as an argument there is a, a like clause uh, with the percent signs or the wild cards. So what this is going to return is all of the bookmarks in the data store that have the word Grails in their title. It's different than saying, give me all the books whose title is Grails, right? I could say, find all by title Grails. Uh, this is finding all the books that have Grails in their title. That's, uh, that's powerful. Um, I can ask for all the bookmarks whose created date is between uh, all the bookmarks that were created in the last week, right? So I create a date object that represents right now. And uh, now minus seven is taking advantage of Groovy's operator overloading. You can subtract the number from a date, and what you're going to get is a date that is that number of days before the date you started with. Uh, 
So this is going to, that query, find by created date between, is going to find all the bookmarks whose uh, created date is in the last week. And again, that'll work. That, that, that's not Hibernate code. That's GORM code. And uh, that will work if I'm using Hibernate or GORM or Cassandra or whatever GORM implementation I'm using. Yeah? Uh, the, the question is, uh, one of them uses find all and the other one doesn't. So we've got find all by and just find by. And is there a difference and do I need the all? Uh, there is a difference and you don't need the all, but they mean two different things. So find all by means give me all the bookmarks that meet some criteria. Uh, find by says give me the first bookmark that meets some criteria. Right? So if you want all the bookmarks that were created in the last week, you would call find all by created date between. And if you wanted the first one, you'd get find by created date between. So the all is optional, but it means something, right? I'm sorry? That's correct. Uh, so Grail's bookmarks is a list, and last week's is going to be just one bookmark. Uh, all of your domain classes have a static method on them called get, and you pass the ID as an argument, and what you'll get back is one of two things. You'll either get null or you'll get a bookmark. Um, so if there is a bookmark in the uh, data, database whose ID is 34, that's what's going to be returned. And if there's not, you'll get null back. Not an exception or any kind of error. You'll just get null back. That's, that's how uh, Gorm tells you that there was no instance uh, whose ID was 34. Uh, and I can use dynamic finders. Um, I can use relationships in my dynamic finders. Find all by bookmark. So bookmark is another persistent entity. So this is going to find all of the comments whose bookmark is this one. Yeah? Find all returns an empty list. Yeah, uh, find all returns an empty list if there are no matching, uh, matching records. Yeah? Yeah, the question is, uh, is the ID property in the bookmark class implicit? And the answer is yes. So all of your, by default, all of your persistent entities have a property called ID, and its, name, uh, its type is a long. Um, and if you want it to be some other type, you can declare it string ID. Um, but by default, all of your persistent entities, all of your GORM persistent entities have a property added to them by the compiler called ID, and its type is a long. And that's what uh, almost all GORM applications want. So that's why that's the default. So in that example, how many times does the database actually take to resolve? Across all these? Uh, once for each of those calls to find some. So uh, one query is sent to the database for bookmark.list. One query, I'm looking for any that result in multiple queries. Those are all, each of those result in one query. Yeah, so I'll, so I'll back off of what I said, right? So if you're using a second level cache, for example, in Hibernate, it could be that these objects are already in memory and the query doesn't have to be sent to the database if you're using the second level cache. Um, and if you're, it, it depends on your data, uh, on the, the GORM implementation you're using. So if you're using the Mongo plugin, maybe the Mongo plugin is doing some caching as well. So it's unclear. You can't tell from looking at this whether or not these will actually go out to the database and come back or not, if that's what you're getting at. Because they could be cached. It would. So that first example is going to load all of the bookmark. Every bookmark that's in the database will be in memory after that call is made. Whether or not they were already in memory or a call had to be made to the database, we can't tell from looking at this. But after calling bookmark.list, uh, in memory will be a representation of every bookmark in the database. So then to resolve the like statement that's not using code, to iterate over the ones in memory. To oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So when you call bookmark.findall by title like, one thing that's not happening, and this would be terrible if this is what did happen, one thing that's not happening is we're not retrieving all the bookmarks and then iterating through them and looking for ones that have grails in their title. That, that wouldn't work. I mean, it would work, but it'd be, uh, uh, it would have obvious problems. What's happening is what we're going to explore when we look at some code in just a bit. Yep. But a query is being sent to the database that dictates that we only want records 
that have grails in their title. More on that uh, when I start writing some code. I want to show uh, one or two more uh, slides here and then jump into the ID and do some uh, hopefully fun stuff. All right, so a couple of ways to express queries are methods like list and get, uh, dynamic finders like find all by, find by, and there are lots of combinations with the dynamic finders, and they're all documented in the user guide really well. But you can say things like find all by age less than 16, uh, find all by first name, find all by first name and last name. Uh, for a long time, or, or find all by, uh, you can use ors. So find all by first name or last name, uh, that sort of thing. You can use combinations like that. And for a long time, you could only use one and or one or. Uh, so you could say, find all by first name and last name, find all by first name and age. But you couldn't say things like find all by first name and last name and age and town and, and so forth. For a long time, you got one and or one or. And I thought that was, uh, that was reasonable. But for, for some time, one of the single highest voted JIRAs uh, that we had was to support an arbitrary number of ands. And, uh, I don't think it's a great idea, but uh, because it was so uh, often requested and it wasn't terribly difficult to implement, we did. So you, now you can, in recent versions of Grails, you can say find all by first name and last name and age and town, and, and you can write uh, uh, the most unreadable code you want to write, right? <laughs> You say, why would you call find all by, um, give me the example again. I didn't. Okay. Yeah, so why would you call find all by uh, first name and last name and age when you could just call, find, call a method and pass in a map that represents your criteria? Um, and uh, so you can do either, right? GORM allows you to do that sort of thing. You can call, uh, you can invoke a method and pass in a map and that map represents your criteria. Um, and for, for a lot of cases, it, it, it really amounts to personal preference. Just what, what is the most easy to write and easy to read, which goes to why I, I wasn't uh, a really big uh, uh, proponent of the arbitrary number of ands and ors, is one of the great things about dynamic finders is they're easy to look at, right? You can, you can look at bookmark.findall by title like. Pretty quickly, you can parse that and know what's going on, right? And find all by age greater than. You can look at that and, and easily see what's happening. When that statement, when that, when that method call gets really long, it's hard to parse, right? So where do the words begin? And uh, it's hard to look at. Um, dynamic finders, uh, the, the real value of a dynamic finder in my mind is it's really expressive. It's easy to write, it's easy to look at, and easy to understand. And if it gets very complicated, don't use a dynamic finder for that, right? Uh, one other option you might use is the criteria API. Right, so all of your domain classes have a method on them called uh, with criteria. The with criteria method accepts a closure, and inside of this closure, you express the criteria of your query. So GORM was originally built on top of Hibernate, and because of that, a lot of the Hibernate words show up in the GORM API. Um, so uh, there's one called EQ, right? If you want to, wanted to return all the bookmarks whose uh, uh, whose title was equal to Grails, instead of like text Grails there, you'd have EQ text Grails there. And that's just the name that the Hibernate API used, so we use the same name in, in our API. Um, but this, this API is not bound to Hibernate. It was influenced by Hibernate because of uh, uh, GORM's early evolution. But it's not bound to Hibernate. This exact same code will work with the other GORM implementations, right? There's just, uh, at runtime, this gets turned into something different if you're using Mongo than if you're using uh, Hibernate. So what's expressed here is, let's do this over here. Uh, so again, imagine we're not in the person class, we're off in a controller or something, but I can say person dot with criteria um, equal name Jeff. All right, so that's going to give me all the persons whose name is, uh, whose first name is Jeff. This needs to be a property name, right? Uh, I could also say greater than age 90. So that's gonna give me all the Jeffs whose age is greater than 90. Right? So it's pretty easy to write, pretty easy to read, easy to look at. Uh, I can also navigate relationships, right? So here we've, we see that a person has a property, let me get rid of these. A person has a property called home address. So I could say home address. And in the address class is a property called city. So I could say equals city St. Louis. Right, so I can navigate around my object graph in this, uh, in this closure. 
Right? So this is going to give me all the persons whose first name is Jeff, their age is greater than 90, and their home address city is St. Louis. Right? And there's a lot more you can ex express in, this, uh, in your criteria there, but uh, uh, questions about, in general, what's going on there. Yeah. Uh, could be. You say, why is the domain object, what was the end, last part of that? Well, so it wouldn't have to be in a controller. It could be anywhere. It could be in code that's under source Groovy. It could be in a service. It could be in a tag lib. Any place in your application where you have to express a query, you could. No, it, it could be. I mean, yeah. So if you could have a method in the person class that does just this. So any place, you can do this anywhere, right? Uh, it's not that common to have methods in your domain class that express queries, but you could. Right? All right, let's press on. Uh, so the, uh, another way to query the database, and this is the least interesting, so I'm not going to spend the least time talking about this, is uh, so Gorm has uh, methods that allow you to express your query in HQL, or Hibernate Query Language. So you're just passing string queries. Uh, it has to be valid HQL. We don't even parse this. We're just giving it to Hibernate, and Hibernate can go about its business. So this won't work with uh, uh, non-Hibernate implementations. But if for some reason you want to express queries in HQL, uh, there, there's, a, there's a way to get there. As I said, that's the least interesting, so I want to spend the least time talking about that. One more query type that I want to talk about before we uh, start writing some, uh, some fun stuff is uh, Grail supports uh, what are called um, uh, where queries. So here we're in a domain class. Uh, this would more likely be someplace else, but uh, just focus on the syntax here. So what that's going to do is that's going to find, that's going to return all the persons, right? So I've called where, and I've passed a closure as an argument, and then invoked that list on whatever's returned from that, that call to where. In here, I can put groovy code, just regular groovy code, right? I'm not calling methods uh, like we were with the criteria, but I'm just, uh, you can put arbitrary groovy code here. And when you do something like age is greater than 10, the Grails compiler turn, uh, modifies that, transforms that into what it takes to create a real query at runtime that represents, uh, it creates the criteria that, that says, give me all the person objects whose age is greater than 10. I could say where uh, first name matches some regular expression, right? So it has to begin with an uppercase letter or something like that. And there's a, there are a whole list of operators. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about this, but there are a list of operators you can use, greater than and in, and uh, you can use regular expression matches. Um, but you're expressing your criteria in real code, right? Just regular groovy code. It's not a query language. It, they're just Boolean conditions that uh, are valid groovy code. And this could be inside of an if block that says, if some condition is true, then do this, otherwise don't do that. So line 12, the age is greater than 10, isn't necessarily part of this query. It's only part of the query under certain circumstances, right? Yeah? I'm assuming the query is by default an and, so how do you make it a one or? Yeah, and it's, it's the, same, the same way you would use with the criteria API we were looking at a minute ago. You could do something like that. So you were correct in your uh, assumption that these things are anded together. So this is going to find me all the persons, oh, yeah do this. I'm thinking about criteria API stuff. You can do this. It's, it's even cooler, right? Uh, so you can use ands and ors, uh, but written like that, you're, those are anded together. Yep. So that would make a difference between the two columns, the where and the where criteria. Is this the where doer with the syntax? Uh, the question is, is there, are there differences between where queries and criteria queries? And uh, the answer is yes. Uh, where queries are processed at compile time, so we can do type checking and so forth, and uh, like if you make a typo here, now the code won't compile. Uh, that's not the case with the criteria API because you're just passing strings around that represent property names. Uh, where queries are really, uh, I think, are, are probably the slickest of all of the, uh, 
uh, uh, query mechanisms we've got right now. Yeah. So what you've got right now, age is referring to a record somewhere in person. If you want to refer to the, if you're actually in a, an instance of person when you're running this, how do you get to the age that's actually the field of the current person? Uh, yeah, so again, normally this wouldn't be inside the person class, but I guess you could do that and then in here do that. I'm trying to think of why that wouldn't work. So now I've got a variable called the age that is initialized with the age of this particular person, and I'm using that as part of the part of the uh, query criteria. And in the if condition, and in the if conditional, you could use age or the age in your if. If you refer to a property, so, so there's compile time transformation stuff going on in here. So this is really a, a missing when you refer to age here. Uh, it's, it's a, uh, generally it's a missing property. There is no age property because normally this wouldn't be in the person class. The compiler is, is dealing with this code in a special way. So when you do a property access like age is greater than 10, what the compiler extension is doing is looking at this class. Remember, you, we wouldn't necessarily be inside the person class here. The compiler will look at the person class and make sure there's an age property. And if there's not, the compiler will throw an error that says, hey, you can't, you can't do that. Um, this code right here never actually gets executed, right? The compiler is uh, reading this code and generating all the stuff that it takes to make the query, but this code never really gets executed. But can you say if age greater than 10 apply the first name pattern match only for people whose age is greater than 10? Uh, let's see, you're saying if, you're saying can you do this? Uh, what is that going to do? Since we're in the person class, that's going to say if the person we're in, right? Never mind the query. If the person we're in, if their age is greater than 10, make this part of the criteria. I shouldn't type this in the person class. It just complicates things. Normally, this wouldn't be in the person class, so there wouldn't be any ambiguity about what age refers to there. All right. I want to press on. I want to be. I want to demonstrate something uh, really quickly, and uh, then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for Q and A. All right, so what I want to explore is the dynamic finder stuff. So you can call, you can do something like this. You can say, I'm going to get out of our person class. Um, so the, the code we're looking at now is not inside of a Grails app. We're inside just a normal, just a, a standalone Groovy app. There's no Grails, no GORM uh, involved here. What I want to do is sort of simulate, I'm going to write some code to simulate a really naive, simple version of one of those query mechanisms we just looked at. And in particular, I want to add support for something like this. I want to be able, so I've got a person class uh, that's defined over here, right? Again, we're not inside of GORM or Grails. It's just a class. It's not a persistent entity. It's just a class. Uh, it has a first name and a last name property. Uh, so I've got a, a, a small Groovy program here that is connecting to an uh, H2 database um, and it, uh, as the application starts up, I create a person table with a couple of columns and insert uh, some rows into, the, into those tables. Um, so by the time we get down here to lines 21 or whatever, uh, we've got a database, a table has been created in the database and um, uh, some rows are in that, in that table. So what I want to be able to do is express a query like person.findall by first name and have that result in some SQL being sent to the database that retrieves all of the persons whose, uh, uh, whose first name is Jeff, right? I want to simulate what Gorm is doing with dynamic finders. And I'm going to do this in a, a really naive, really simple way. It's not as robust as what's really in Gorm, but it'll be enough to give you a sense for how some of this works inside of Grails, right? When you're in Grails, uh, you can do this. But even though you've never written the find all by first name method, somehow Gorm knows how to deal with that and turn it into something meaningful. And uh, with uh, eight or 10 lines of code, we're going to be able to reproduce uh, a naive version of that. So right now, if I were to run this code, we should get a missing method exception. All right, run this groovy script. Because we're invoking person.findall by first name, no such method exists, missing method exception, can't do that, right? That's what I would expect. Uh, but we're going to do some runtime metaprogramming here to help with that. 
All right, so what I've just now done, let's get rid of all this other stuff, is at runtime, I'm adding a method called uh, method missing to the, uh, to the person class. I'm adding a static method missing to the person class. And the way, I see what's wrong here now. Um, so in Groovy, when you in invoke a method that doesn't exist on some object, normally what will happen is a missing method exception will be thrown. But uh, that's not necessarily what will happen. If the class in question has a method in it called method missing, then instead of throwing a missing method exception, Groovy will invoke that, and then this method missing method gets to decide how to respond to this method call. The person class does not have a method missing in it. It could have. We could write a method missing method in the person class, but I don't want to do that because I want to simulate what's going on inside of Grails. So when you write the person domain class inside of Grails, you don't have to write method missing, and you don't have to write find all by first name. All that just happens. And how it happens is at runtime, Grails is doing, Gorm is doing something like this to all of your domain classes. It's adding a static method missing. And uh, we can start by doing something like this. So anytime I invoke a method that doesn't exist, that's what's going to happen. So let's run that and uh, verify that does what we expect it to do. All right, method name, find all by first name. So I invoke the method that didn't exist, and this method missing that was added to the person class at runtime intercepted that method call, and uh, I can do whatever I want to do inside of that method missing. Comments about that? Uh, let's see, if name, we'll do this, we'll say name is a finder, else name is not a finder. So I'm interrogating the method name to see if it begins with find all by. And if it does, it's a finder. And if it doesn't, it's not. So we'll we'll call some other methods, like get all the people. All right, let's run that. There we go. Find all by first name is a finder. Get all the people is not a finder. So the method missing is interrogating the method name and deciding if it, we want to do something special about it. So if it's not a finder, let's just throw a uh, new method missing. Uh, so we could have had some error handling here. We could throw a method missing exception. I'm going to, that's not the interesting part of this. In the interest of time, we'll just leave that out. So we'll only add code to support the happy path. That is uh, dynamic finders. We'll assume the thing is a dynamic finder. So uh, what I want to do is I want to generate a query that looks something like this. Select star from person where uh, first name equals Jeff, right? Uh, in response to this call right here, I want to generate a SQL string that looks something like this. So I can do that. I can say uh, def prop name equals name. See if I got the indexes right there. So I want everything that's after the find all by. And that looks like it worked. I got first name. So uh, Groovy has this syntax for doing uh, string, substring stuff. So what this is going to give me is all the sh characters starting at index 9 up to and including the last character. Negative 1 is the last character. Uh, so I can turn that in. I can use that in a SQL string. I can say uh, def uh, query equals select star from person where prop name equals question mark, and so forth, right? So now I, I've dynamically built up this, uh, and I, I've hard-coded person here, but I wouldn't have to do that either. I can dynamically generate that. But I can dynamically generate this query based on the method name and send that query to the database and get back only the rows that satisfied this criteria. And then if I change this to find all by last name, uh, of course, prop name will be last name instead of first name. Um, so I've got this uh, uh, flexible piece of code here that can respond to methods like this. And the real one, I'm not going to uh, go through the rest of this to, to make it actually function, but it, you've seen the, the interesting part of this is dynamically we can add a method missing to classes at runtime, intercept uh, calls to those missing methods, 
look at the method name, and then do stuff, right? So when you call find all by last name like, the, there's a sophisticated part of GORM that parses that method name and says, okay, you started with find all by, so you must be executing a query, and we parse the rest of it. It says last name like, so there's some mechanism in there that looks for the word like and I like and greater than and stuff like that, and uh, it's a, a pretty sophisticated, complicated piece of, the, piece of the framework, but we're able to parse that method name and pull all the individual pieces out that are necessary to understand what it is you're uh, you want the criteria of this query to be, and use that to build up uh, a query that can be sent to the database to, to return the data that you're interested in. Yeah? You can't, uh, the question is, th does this mean that I can't already do something like this because it's already been used by GORM? Uh, you cannot add a method missing to your domain classes. You could do it, but you're going to foul up everything that, that GORM is doing with that. There can only be one method missing on a class. Uh, so if you were to add your own method missing to domain classes, uh, uh, bad things are going to happen. All the GORM stuff's not going to work. How are you actually people? Say that again. How are we actually doing what? In GORM? It's not. It's Hibernate. Right, so Hibernate doesn't do anything, there's nothing groovy about it, right? So instead of generating this SQL string, what we're doing is creating Hibernate criteria objects and iterating, interacting with that whole API, but groovy SQL doesn't come into it. If we were gonna carry this out and make this work with another eight or 10 lines of code, that's exactly what it would do, just write groovy SQL code, or you could write just normal JDB, you could do whatever you wanted is, is the point. So GORM parses these, or intercepts these method calls, parses the method names, um, understands, uh, is able to build up sort of a comprehension of what your criteria are and then knows what to do with that. And that last part, the knows what to do with that, is different for the Hibernate plugin uh, than it would be for the MongoDB plugin, as an example. Yeah. Other thoughts or questions or comments about any of that? Yes, well, yeah, so the, it became two questions there at the very end. So the, it started with, uh, what if you wanted to execute a query uh, directly and not necessarily in, uh, interact with GORM? So inside of a Grails app, it's uh, really simple to get a reference to the data source. There's a bean in the Spring application called data source, the Spring application context called data source, and you can have that injected into a service or a controller or whatever you want, and you can just go about your business writing JDBC code and leave GORM out of it altogether. Uh, but then at the very end, um, you pointed out uh, uh, an idea that maybe you don't really want a person object, you just want a first name and a last name. Um, and you can do that with uh, the query me mechanisms that I described. You can express projections that cause uh, the query not to return person objects, but to return first names and last names, and that's it. Don't, const don't uh, uh, rehydrate all these person, we don't want person objects, I just want information uh, that uh, belongs to person objects, like first name and last name. There are ways to express that in your queries that I didn't represent, but you can definitely do that. So if, if you just want a list of first names, you don't have to write SQL to do that. You can still use GORM and use projections, and, and uh, you, you can get there without having to write your own queries. Yeah? What version of Grails introduced the where? Uh, Grails 2 point, because I don't remember what comes after the point. 2.2 is what I'm being told. That, that sounds right. I think that might have been introduced in 2.2. Yeah. One more question and then we'll break for lunch. And I'm happy to answer questions as long as you like. But, yeah, go ahead. For what support? Is there currently uh, uh, plans to support spatial data? Uh, the, there is stuff that Graham added recently to Mongo that has to do with uh, coordinates and spatial stuff. Uh, and that's about all that I know about it, that such a thing exists. Um, so you could, uh, uh, Graham's here, we can ask him about that, but I know there's spatial support in the GORM, in the Mongo uh, implementation, not Hibernate or any other implementation that I'm aware of. So if you have more questions, I'm happy to, uh, to talk to you as long as you like. Thank you all very much.